I'm going to be talking today about a relatively simple and hopefully kind of neat project that I've been working on along with David Fleet, who's here right now, and he was the chair of the previous session. Um, we've been working on something called FSCV, Fourier Shell Cross Validation, um, which is a project in which we've tried to explore a little bit of a new way to think about resolution estimation in, in cryo-EM, in single particle cryo-EM, um, which is a topic that I'm somewhat nervous to talk about, uh, given the scolding we got uh, <laughs> earlier today. <laughs> Um, but hopefully you guys can think, see what you think about what we've done. So resolution estimation is a specific task that's important in, in single particle EM, but maybe a better summary of this project is that what we try to do is apply a somewhat more general principle of cross-validation to develop a framework from which tasks like resolution estimation and other things can be naturally formulated and solutions can be derived from what are hopefully first principles. Um, of course, resolution estimation today is very well established and practically is very, very important in single particle EM. Um, and the Fourier shell correlation is, is widely used as the sort of standard tool for estimating resolution of sing single particle EM maps. And resolution estimation via the FSC is used both for validating a map after reconstruction, but also in, in several programs, including CryoSpark, for some forms of regularization to prevent overfitting during a refinement. So it's doubly important. Um, the FSC in particular has been given a lot of thought in the community, and it can generally be derived or thought of based on some assumptions about the 3D density maps that are uh, input to it. So if you have two independent half maps, the assumptions in particular are that these two half maps in real space um, are independent. They have Gaussian noise in Fourier space with some color, um, potentially, but those Fourier components are all IID, or at least independent. Um, and that means that individual Fourier shells of the two half maps can be correlated with each other. And the independence of Fourier shells from other Fourier shells means that we can directly compute this FSC curve, which hopefully gives us some indication about the trustability of signal in a particular frequency range. Um, interpreting the FSC curve is also well established, and I'm not going to get into that territory about thresholds. Um, I know there's a lot of literature there. Um, but uh, in this work, we've actually focused on a slightly different aspect of the FSC, which is that in practice, the assumptions behind how the FSC is defined and derived are often broken, almost always broken. In fact, the most critical way in, the, way in which this is always done is with real space masking. Um, and for that purpose, masking, first of all, is critical in single particle EM, of course, because people, practitioners, don't want to underestimate the signal in the protein parts of a structure by including the solvent in part of the resolution estimate. So masking is used all the time, and to deal with the fact that masking breaks the assumptions, the idea of high-resolution noise substitution has been developed, um, which is, again, widely used. Um, the breaking of the assumptions behind the FSC is an issue in practice that I'm just going to demonstrate with a simple example. These are two uh, half maps from the STRA6 receptor. Um, it's a membrane protein, which is not that important for the math, but just interesting because there are definitely different parts of the structure that have different sort of characteristics. These are the two half maps. Um, I'm going to be showing here uh, FSC curves as well as the high resolution noise substitution corrected versions of those FSC curves, which are what people typically use today in practice. So starting on the left side, you'll see here just an image of one of the side views of the protein. And the highlighted region is the mask that's being applied right now. Um, on the right is the FSC curve. So in the blue line, which you can barely see, is the just raw FSC curve between the two half maps using this mask. And the orange line is the FSC curve after noise substitution correction. With a very large mask that clearly is far away from the edges of the protein and including lots of solvent, we can see that the FSC and the noise substitution FSC agree. Um, there doesn't seem to be any cause for concern, but a practitioner would feel that this resolution estimate is definitely undervaluing their hard work. So they will probably look for a tighter mask and continue tightening that mask, each time hopefully increasing the resolution that the FSC points out to them, um, until they get to a mask that's relatively tightly fit around the structure. And at this point, we can start to see that the noise substitution curve starts to diverge a little bit from the regular uh, Fourier shell correlation curve. Um, and that's the kind of diagnostic that people use in practice. Of course, a practitioner might also decide that some parts of the protein are more important than others, so they might mask out, for example, the entire micelle, and then yield an FSC curve which Again, shows a higher resolution, but this process obviously leads a question of when we should stop. A user might decide to further tighten the mask, and now we can clearly see that the noise substitution criteria shows us that this mask is causing a huge amount of correlation between the half maps. So that's well established. Um, in practice, however, there are questions 
to be asked here. First of all, when the mask is this tight and we do noise substitution, can we now trust the orange line as a resolution estimate? Or is it just telling us, is this just diagnostic, which is how it's used in practice, telling us that this mask is too tight? Um, the second question is, what happens when a user wants to think about the resolution of a particular section of a protein, for example, or if they want to use a sharper mask, which severely degrades uh, both curves? And in this case, we can actually see that um, now the noise substitution, substituted corrective, corrected curve is definitely not a great resolution estimate because it doesn't ever get to zero, and it kind of floats around this line. Um, so in practice, there are also other questions when a user wants to look at a particular region of a structure or focus on a region of a structure, let's say in a, an approach that looks like windowed FSC for local resolution estimation. In all of these cases, the noise substitution uh, system tells us that these masks are causing correlations between the structure by either uh, cutting through density or creating structure by the shape of the mask. So even with masks that don't have a shape themselves like this small, soft, spherical mask, the fact that they're cutting through the density still causes correlation between the half masks. So this overall doesn't really leave us with a huge amount of confidence in being able to estimate resolutions of parts of a structure or really know that we're treating the mask okay at all. This is another last example showing when we move the mask away from the core region of the protein to just the micelle where we know there's relatively limited amount of structure, there's still a huge amount of correlation caused by the mask. And noise substitution tells us that something's wrong. So this whole phenomenon was part of the motivation for why we kind of embarked on this project. Um, and noticing this really made us feel that maybe instead of trying to fix this directly, uh, what we should aim for is a more general formulation of the question of what resolution estimation means and how to assess some notion of separating signal from noise in a reconstruction. And then we want to try and use that to derive a solution for what resolution estimation can be. So in that direction, we can start to think of a slightly different way of formulating resolution estimation instead of being about an FSC that is kind of written down as a formula and then thought about in terms of its statistical properties. Instead, we can think about resolution estimation as hyperparameter optimization. Um, the way you can sort of think about this is to start by considering a typical single particle data set. There's a whole bunch of particles, and you can do a reconstruction with those particles pretty much up to an arbitrary resolution, up to the Nyquist rate. Of course, that won't be correct, and lots of that reconstructed stuff in the raw reconstruction up here will be wrong. Uh, the question then about resolution estimation is how to separate valid signal from noise. And that process often looks like filtering, where we think about the structure in some basis and throw away some information in certain directions that isn't quite correct. So the question of resolution estimation really ends up being, out of some family of possible filters that we could apply to a reconstruction, which one separates signal from noise and tells us which information is trustable? Which of those filters, which each correspond implicitly to a model, a prior, on what the signal-to-noise characteristics of the structure are? Um, thinking about the resolution in this sense, we can connect this to the broader picture of what's going on in 3D reconstruction in CryoEM, which is a statistical inference problem. Uh, this is a probabilistic graphical model that just kind of depicts the various pieces that everyone's familiar with. We observe images, they have some CTFs, we estimate some latent variables like pose, and then we use those images to infer a 3D structure that can explain the images. The choice of what signal to trust and what part is noise corresponds in this model to a prior on 3D structures, and that prior has some hyperparameters, which we, we will refer to as theta. And so resolution estimation ends up being, in this world, the same as selecting or optimizing these theta hyperparameters of this prior. And if we do that right, we can hopefully yield a choice of theta that corresponds with separating trusted information from noise. Now, in the world of machine learning, uh, hyperparameter optimization given some data and a model is very well studied and very well established. A principled and general solution is cross-validation or k-fold cross-validation. The idea in cross-validation is to split up your data into multiple sections, um, choose some sections to fit a model, including its parameters, and then test that model on the remaining held out data that hasn't been seen. And you can then, on that held out data, measure how good those, that choice of parameters were. You can do that across multiple splits of the data, choosing a different test set every time. And the idea in order to actually optimize hyperparameters is to minimize the cross-validation error, which is the error on those test sets um, across all the runs, across all the possible choices of parameters. Uh, 
And the best parameter, which corresponds to the best choice of separating signal to noise in our case, will be the minimum of that cross-validation error. Cross-validation has a couple of nice properties. First of all, it's nearly unbiased uh, in terms of yielding unbiased hyperparameter estimates. I won't get into the details of why that is the case. Um, but it's also nice because it works even in the presence of model misspecification, unlike other hyperparameter choosing methods like Bayesian uh, techniques for inference of hyperparameters. Um, so cross-validation, even if we say something wrong in our model, like maybe our protein doesn't actually correspond to just some part of protein and some part of solvent. Maybe there's something else going on, like a partially occupied state or something like that. Even in all those cases, we'll still get a cross-validated estimate that doesn't overestimate what is present in the data. So in fact, FSC, which we're all familiar with, already uses a similar concept to cross-validation by splitting up independent sets of data into two half maps. So our question with this project was, is there a more explicit formulation of cross-validation as a way to think about resolution? And is there in particular a way that incorporates the presence of masking, which is by far the biggest um, issue with FSC? It turns out the answer is yes. So I'm going to describe what we've called the FSCV, Fourier shell cross-validation, uh, just to kind of keep the acronym going. <laughs> um, so the FSCV is both a formulation and a solution to the problem that I've been laying out. Um, and namely, that's how to decide what signal you can trust and which part is noise. The way FSCV, FSCV can be set up is the following. Consider a simplified version of our reconstruction problem where what we have are two independent noisy observations. Those are the two half maps each one being drawn from some true structure that has some amount of resolvable signal um, plus noise. And that true structure has a hyperparameter which controls which part of the structure is actually resolvable in terms of resolution, and that is those parameters theta. In this setting, um, we can define that's that family of filters that I mentioned that theta parameterizes in any way we want. But the simplest way that I'll start with is by saying that our family of filters, which are defined as f with a parameter theta, um, are a simple operation. You take a structure in Fourier space, and you multiply it by this radially symmetric isotropic filter in Fourier space. So that's exactly corresponding to how we think of Fourier shells and FSC and everything else. Just a little explicitly stated that the filtering operation that we're applying has these parameters theta, which define a one-dimensional filter. We take that and expand it into three dimensions. That forms R of theta. Multiply that by the Fourier transform of the structure, and that gives us a filtered version of the structure. So this is defining what our model about the prior of signal and noise at each spatial wavelength is. Um, and if we just take this and stick it into the standard way to set up a cross-validation problem, what we end up with is with, with this expression. So this is twofold cross-validation. I'll just explain this uh, um, equation. What we're looking for is the minimum over parameters that we could choose of two terms, each of which is one fold out of the two-fold cross-validation. The left term is where we are holding out the B side data and filtering the A side to be able to um, reconstruct what we estimate the true structure is given just the A side. We measure the discrepancy between that and the B side, which is held out, and that error forms one part of our cross-validation error. The second side is the opposite, a mirror image where we filter the B side, hold out the A side, and then compare. So this is a pretty natural setup for, and it's kind of exactly what you do in cross-validation. And the nice things about it are that because it's an optimization problem formulation, we could have chosen any f of theta. It would just make our optimization problem more difficult. In this case, this is a very simple version, but um, we get that nice property. The next question is, what is the solution to this, and what are the characteristics of that solution? So if we first start off with a simple case where, again, there's no mask. We're just thinking about the simple case where we have an a entire structure that fills an entire box. Um, solving this is really kind of straightforward. First, we start with the definition of f of theta, which is this um, isotropic filter in Fourier space. Because there is no mask, all of the Fourier shells are independent. And it turns out that that naturally follows in the optimization problem that we can split up this optimization problem into each one of the Fourier shells independently. Um, doing that gets us this expression, which is just the cross-validation error within one single Fourier shell, which is uh, indexed by theta i. And then solving for that theta i, this is a simple quadratic, uh, 1D quadratic problem, gives us an expression that defines the, this FSCV expression. Again, this is without a mask. Uh, 
and there were no assumptions made other than what I explained to get here. This is exactly the expression that the optimization problem uh, prescribes for us. What's cool is if we compare that to the standard FSC, they're actually very similar. Um, what we can see is the difference here uh, is first of all that, uh, I'll explain it several properties, but uh, on one side with the FSCV, the numerator first of all is the same, that's just the correlation between a shell on the A side and a shell on the B side, same as the FSC. Uh, but the denominator on the FSC side is the geometric mean between the power of the same shell on the A side and the, the corresponding shell on the B side. Um, with the FSCV, instead, we end up with the arithmetic mean of those powers. And that's kind of interesting because it leads to a few properties. First of all, the FSCV is bounded. It's always less than or equal to the FSC, and it's always less than or equal to one. What's really interesting or really useful in practice, actually, is that when the half maps, A and B, have the same amount of power in every shell, then the arithmetic mean and geometric mean are the same, and the FSCV and the FSC are identical. So that's nice. It tells us that actually the FSC is already close to optimal in the sense of this cross-validation setup. Um, and that has some implications in terms of why it was actually a good idea that people have been using for all this time to filter structures using the FSC during a refinement. That makes a lot of sense because now we know that a very similar expression actually corresponds to the optimal choice of hyperparameters over a 3D structure while you're doing inference. Um, so that's neat. But we haven't actually explicitly accounted for the mask yet. So now the version with the mask which is actually much more interesting. This time we can define f of theta a little bit differently. We start off with the same x times r of theta, so that's just filtering a structure by some 1D filter expanded into 3D. Then we bring that back into Fourier space with an inverse Fourier transform, apply a real space mask, and then go back to Fourier space. So our filtering operation now, which is still parameterized by theta, now has this mask that we can use to choose which parts of a structure we actually care about. And I'll explain exactly how that works out in the math. Um, but this is substantially different than how the mask is used in other senses, like in the FSC. In the FSC, the, the structure is masked first in real space before we compare it to the other half map. Um, in this setting, we're actually just defining this filtering operation, which applies the mask after filtering. Um, and when we plug that into our cross-validation expression, it's a little bit uglier to solve. Um, but what's neat about it is that because this filtering operation is still linear in terms of theta, which is helpful, um, it's linear in terms of theta, so when we change the theta filter coefficients, this side, which is the filtered masked version of A, changes linearly. That means this entire term is just a quadratic form, although now very large and ugly, still just a quadratic form in theta. Same with the other side, quadratic form in theta. Um, and solving this turns out is feasible. I'll talk about it in a sec. But just from the formulation itself, we can get some idea of the properties of the solution of this. First of all, like I mentioned, what's neat about this setup is that we never actually compare a masked version of either half map to a masked version of the other half map. We're always validating a masked version of A against the entire held out version of B. So that includes all the noise and the solvents and everything. But of course, on this side, the masked region says that anything outside the mask has zero values in real space. So in that sense, what this means is that when we are adjusting theta to find the best theta, we don't care about voxels that are outside of the mask. This is different than creating a correlation with the mask. This is literally saying, find me the best spatial resolutions that I can trust within a particular mask selection region. To see that more clearly, I've just taken the same expression again. Because this norm is Euclidean and the Fourier transform is orthogonal, we can just uh, move things around a little bit to come to real space. And now we can see that what we're comparing is the real space version of half map B with the masked real space filtered version of half map A. And because the map will define some regions that have zeros in the mask, um, in this Euclidean norm, all of those voxels in real space will count for nothing in the sense that they won't depend on theta. And so those terms can be left out, and what we can rewrite this as is simply a sum over voxels that are literally inside of the mask. And that sum contains the cross-validation error between the two half maps. So now we're not even applying masks to the half maps, but we're saying after filtering A, just think about the voxels inside the mask. How, do the, how does A match with B? So that's a, an interesting point, and that's actually what yields all the nice properties of the mask version of FSCV. Um, so solving it, I'll again go through, and this may not be too relevant for everyone, 
Um, the, the system is, like I said, linear, or the, the, this part is linear, and the whole system is quadratic in theta. Um, to see that, we can FOIL out these uh, quadratic forms. Um, and each of these terms, which are a filtering operation on one of the half maps, we can write as a simple matrix operation made of three parts, uh, a vector of the filter coefficients. So these are defining the filter in one dimension, a rotational expansion operation that takes that filter in one dimension and expands it into three dimensions, literally turning it into a, a matrix of n cubed by n cubed terms that is diagonal, and then multiplying that point-wise by a diagonal, diagonal matrix of A values, rather just multiplying those matrices. So what we can see here is that our quadratic form is really simple. There's a theta times something times theta term, that's the quadratic term, and then there's a theta times something constant term, that's a linear term, and together they form a simple quadratic system. The problem is that capital Q and little q are very ugly now. And the reason they're ugly is because they actually mean something. The capital Q is taking into account the effect in Fourier space due to the mask. The mask correlates and couples Fourier shells. And so that coupling is, is ignored in the FSC. But in the FSCV, naturally out of this optimization, the capital Q term captures the coupling between different Fourier shells. The little q term captures how well the different half maps agree or disagree. Um, so it turns out actually that although these are really ugly, I won't get into how you construct them, it's possible to construct capital Q and little q just in multiple passes, essentially one column at a time. It requires a lot of Fourier transforms and we do it on the GPU, but uh, it definitely can be done in a few seconds for a typical sized uh, structure. So once we have this, we can simply solve this quadratic pro problem as a linear system, and that gives us the direct solution for what is the FSCV. So this whole formulation and solution is now complete. We can start using it to solve the resolution question for uh, half maps. But there's actually just one missing ingredient, which is a choice that we haven't yet specified of what exactly does theta correspond to and how does it parameterize the filter um, that we're thinking of. And in particular, how many degrees of freedom does it have? And this is a really important question. I'm just going to go through a pictor pictographic um, argument about why that's the case. Consider a structure that fills up the entire box. There's signal and there's noise in the solvent region, but there's, these are all non-zero values or just not empty values. Um, this structure in real space, let's say the box is 2n by 2n. In Fourier space, there are n shells. And when we compute the FSC, we would naturally think that there are n different independent shells. And that would be correct because all the Fourier terms are independent here since there's no mask. And so all the Fourier shells are independent and there's n of them. If we then think about the operation of just zero padding that structure, we have introduced no new information here, really changed nothing at all about the content or the quality of this map. But now all of a sudden in Fourier space, there are twice as many shells. Um, and of course, these shells are no longer independent now because we have zero padded the structure and all of these zeros correlate Fourier terms with each other. So we can say that here, even though we've zero padded, there still should only be n independent shells. That's a sort of reasonable idea. If we think of the opposite um, operation of masking a structure that's larger and has lots of, uh, like the whole box is full of noise and structure, that initially has two end shells which are independent. But when we mask it, it turns into the same picture as the middle version, which we agree should have only end shells. And so the idea, the idea of choosing a number of degrees of freedom is that when we mask, we should naturally reduce the number of degrees of freedom with which we estimate a resolution curve, which I think is a very natural idea. People n kind of get the notion that as you mask a sm smaller and smaller, the precision with which you can determine a resolution gets worse and worse, since it's essentially the uncertainty principle. Um, there are less wavelengths within a smaller masked region, so your precision of determining a resolution gets worse. So the idea with the FSCV that we've used is that we directly estimate the width of a mask. So we take a mask that we might define, estimate its width as the minimum width along viewing directions, and that width is used to determine how many independent degrees of freedom the FSCV should actually have. Okay. So all of those pieces together allow us to actually define the FSCV operation entirely. Take the two half maps and a mask, Compute the width of the mask to determine the number of degrees of freedom in theta. That helps us to define, first of all, how, the number of degrees of freedom and how theta actually corresponds to a 1D filter. 
and then the rotational operation expansion operator, R of theta. Use all those pieces to compute the capital Q and little Q vectors or matrices, solve the system. This solution, by the way, can also be done with some other constraints if we like. For example, we can enforce the idea that maybe our optimal filter should always be bounded between zero and one, since it kind of doesn't make sense to have a negative filtering, um, but that's optional. And then plot that theta against resolution. So that's kind of straightforward. It turns out to work really nicely in practice. So these are the same exact masks and structure and curves that I showed before. This is with a very large mask that uh, kind of covers the entire structure and some solvent. And we see that the FSCV curve, which is computed just like I talked about, lines up almost perfectly with the original FSC and the noise substitution corrected curve. As we make the mask tighter, that continues to be the case until at a certain point, we start making the mask too tight. And I'll just flip through these again for everyone to see. So with a large mask, the resolution is getting better as the mask gets tighter. And then at a certain point when the mask gets too tight, our original FSC and noise substitution corrected curves continue to overestimate the resolution because of the correlation created by the mask. But the FSCV does not, and the resolution estimate remains consistent. We can even make the mask sharp. Oh, sorry, I went the wrong way. We can even make the mask sharp, and the FSCV is still identical, since like I mentioned, the FSCV thinks of the mask not as a mask that's applied in real space, but just a selection of voxels that we care about, whereas the other two curves become even more uh, un uninterpretable. Finally, we can choose subregions of a structure, and we see that now the number of degrees of freedom as we make the mask smaller in the FSCV curve, which are denoted by the black points, uh, shrinks, but the resolution estimation estimate still stays consistent. We can see, though, that now with this estimate, the transmembrane helices of this structure actually have a slightly higher resolution than the rest of the resolved protein structure. We can also do this with spherical masks to look at local resolutions and have those be consistent. And when we're looking at a region that actually doesn't have much structure, the FSCV doesn't overestimate the resolution. And what this really means is that the FSCV decouples the shape of the mask and the structure induced by the mask from the structure that's actually present in the half maps. So that's basically it about the FSCV. I'm just gonna talk about some of the implications um, if and when the FSCV becomes something that people can start to use in practice. Um, first of all, we can pretty much with a star trust the resolution estimate within any mask. Of course, if a mask is very small, that will automatically reduce the number of degrees of freedom until our FSCV curve just has one point which is the correct thing. Um, we can also use binary selection masks, so we don't need to tune the fall off or how softly the mask is shaped. Um, that doesn't matter anymore. We can get valid resolution estimates of subregions of a structure without worrying about bias from the mask cutting through density. It's often the case that core regions of a structure that are closer to the center are at a higher resolution, and the sig that signal inside we can now actually validate and therefore keep instead of having to take the average resolution of the entire structure and throw away anything that's higher. Um, peripheral regions that might be defined during, with flexible or disordered parts of a structure, if you're doing local refinements, multi-body refinement, et cetera, the resolution in those masked areas can actually now be trusted. Um, and the FSCV curve can directly indicate to a user the resolvable precision of the resolution using the degrees of freedom. And finally, I kind of mentioned this before, um, this whole project kind of gives a theoretical basis for why FSC filtering was a very good idea during refinement to mitigate overfitting since it corresponds with the FSCV, which is in this cross-validation sense, the optimal filter. So the hope is that this can reduce user bias in publications where masks are often highly tuned to boost the FSC of a structure. Um, it can also allow publications to explicitly state resolutions of subregions of a volume and have those actually be accepted. Um, in the future, uh, as this project goes forward, one of the things we can do is actually go back to the images. Um, and instead of taking the simplified version of the problem that I showed with just a true structure and half maps, we can think of the version where we actually just take two sets of images and then construct k-fold cross-validation. It doesn't have to be two-fold anymore. Um, in that world, we can incorporate noise models and a fully likelihood-based version of cross-validation that takes into account all the other things we know about uh, private VM reconstruction. There are also many other formulations possible. And we've worked on some projects already in this direction that I won't talk about now, but you can choose different choices of the filter family. You can deal with anisotropy in a more principled way, both uh, over space and in directions. 
Um, and the FSCV, because it doesn't mind model misspecification, since it's based on cross-validation, can also be used with other reconstruction algorithms that, by their very nature, would break the assumptions of the FSC. For example, if you had a reconstruction algorithm that only produced non-negative maps and cut out all the negative values, as a simple example, that's something that the FSC would always complain about, um, but F FSCV would actually not mind that since model misspec misspecification is not a problem. And that is all. Oh.